Hey guys, welcome back to One Candle Society for the season finale of our Paranormal Case Files. Here with your host Vic Whaley and Marcus D. And guys, strap in and come along with us because we're going to go check out the mystery that is Portlock, Alaska. <laughs> In the early 20th century, the town of Portlock, Alaska was established as a cannery town within the Kenai Peninsula. Populated by mostly Russian and Aleut natives, the town of Portlock in its early days saw peace and tranquility for its inhabitants. Although the situation in the town would soon take a very dark turn. Shortly after World War II, Residents of the town became alarmed when men in the town would go missing when they went to hunt in the Alaskan woods. Search parties wouldn't find survivors, but instead found something much more alarming. Dismembered body parts would wash up on the shore and the townsfolk were spotting 18 inch humanoid tracks were being spotted in the woods by the terrified townsfolk. In 1931, Andrew Kamluck a local logger was found bludgeoned to death. A large piece of logging equipment was believed to be the murder weapon, but witnesses reported that this piece of equipment was too large to be wielded by an average man. Rumors began circulating in the town that the missing and murdered men had fallen victim to the Nantanuk, or Big Hairy Man. This creature was a large, eight-foot, hairy, ape-like creature that legends say stalks the woods of Alaska. After years and years of townsfolk going missing or being murdered, the local population of Portlock believed that there would be no reprieve anytime soon. In 1949, the townsfolk decided that the safest thing to do would be to simply move. Years later, former residents of Portlock and descendants of those former residents still refused to return to the ghost town of Portlock, Alaska fearing to feel the wrath of the Nantinuk once again. Okay guys, one of the first things we really need to talk about is whatever this is around Portlock, Alaska, it isn't your standard gentle wood ape. This thing's out there causing some serious havoc. Yeah, every time we check out any other stores involving Sasquatches or Big Feet or anything like that, what are they doing? They're rooting through the garbage. They're just wandering around in the woods minding their own business. No, this is just a straight murderous monster that lives in the woods of Alaska. Yeah, he's not, you know, bounding from meadow to meadow. Maybe you make eye contact, have a spiritual moment. No, he wants to beat you over the head with logging equipment and rip your arms and legs off. And then hide the body. This is just... <laughs> Not a straightforward Bigfoot encounter, guys. That's why we picked this as our season finale. Yeah, this seems to be a very unique sort of Bigfoot sighting. I mean, this isn't the only time I've heard of aggressive Bigfoot. I've heard of ones around Texas, and, you know, you have um, stories like that from Russia, from the Himalayas of them being aggressive. But for the most part, it's pretty off point. Yeah, it, it totally changes the dialogue. When you're talking about Bigfoot encounters, when you zero in on Alaska, I mean, that's one of the things we were finding whenever we were researching this topic on Portlock, Alaska, was all the stories of Alaska, hunters coming out and finding them, and Bigfoots are ripping up trees, and they're murdering people, and just causing all sorts of havoc up there. I mean, but that, of course, begs the question, what makes the ones in these pockets where they're violent so different? To me, I'm, th I'm thinking maybe it's a diet thing. Maybe there's not as many trees where you can eat or fruits or veggies or berries. I don't know out there like like in other parts of the country. That was my first guess out there. Maybe he's having to sustain himself on a diet of actual meat like moose, deer, sheep, or whatever that they could find out there. That's what's causing him to become so much more aggressive. Another possibility is uh, the geography of the area is kind of unique. It's almost naturally impassable. It's a peninsula that's surrounded by extremely rough terrain. 
maybe it has something to do with a group of them becoming isolated and taking kind of a divergent evolutionary or even cultural path. Kind of depends on how you want to look at Sasquatch. Well, something else that could be causing it too, when you look at stories of encounters in Alaska, they're often single Bigfoot encounters. Sometimes even down in like the Pacific Northwest, or even in Kentucky, you talk about Bigfoot hunters, they talk about seeing big feet. I know it's not a term that, that comes up a lot, but they will see like, like families together. You don't see that in Port Lock, Alaska, or the surrounding, just Alaska in general. It's just these single things that are out there. So maybe it's a solitary creature, so he's less socialized, which is causing him to become more aggressive, kind of like a, like a bear or something, something a little bit more aggressive. Yeah, when you look at the stories about Portlock, I think there's only one that involves multiple big feet, or Sasquatch, you got me saying it now. And that's from, I think, 1900. And it was a group of them kind of aggressing this one man. But yeah, for the most part, it's, it's just one isolated individual, which can make sense if it's intended to be a social creature and it's cut off from sociality, that causes stress within an animal. I mean, this change in behavior even changes the dialogue in investigators that go out and look for it. I mean, if you've seen Bigfoot hunters on TV, how do they normally sound? They sound like guys, oh, we're going to the woods to hunt these elusive Bigfoot creatures that are hiding out in the woods and we have to track them down. Like, I was checking out this group called Extreme Expeditions Northwest, and they're going out to Portlock, Alaska to actually investigate the town and look for one of these things out there. And their dialogue is just totally different. They're like, all right, we're gonna go out there and we're gonna search for this Bigfoot. This is gonna be different because when we go out there, it's gonna attack us. It's gonna get us, it's gonna jump out at us. Not something you typically hear from, what are they, Squatchers, Squatchies, what it? I, I've heard the term Squatchers before. Yeah, but normally, it's kind of like a leisurely throw, stroll through the woods. They're going to go out, they're going to knock on some trees, they're going to do some calls, but they don't really seem like they're prepared to encounter an aggressive animal. Both groups carry big guns. I mean, come on, let's, let's not lie. <laughs> it, it, it is, and it's more common to see someone who's out looking for Sasquatch carrying a gun than, you know, a ghost hunter. And heck, if I was in an area with just big primates in general, I wouldn't mind having one. Yeah, low-lying gorillas for the most part are fairly docile, but you know, I'd like to have that just in case. Speaking of that, I did some digging into kind of primate behavior, trying to get some ideas of what, may, what might make the Sasquatches here so aggressive, and I found a few interesting things. When examining low-lying gorillas, one of the things that can happen is if they've had violent encounters involving guns before, just simply hearing guns can throw them into this kind of violent frenzy, which makes me think maybe this is something that's happened before. Maybe he's encountered a hunter and has been shot at before, and now just hearing the sounds, and they do say that even back then, there was a lot of hunting going on of these dull sheep. So maybe it hears hunters in the area firing at the sheep, and then he just loses it and goes after whatever it can find. But you still have plenty of hunters in like Kentucky, Washington State, Oregon, Northern California, where these other Bigfoot encounters are sighting, and they're nowhere near as aggressive in those kinds of stories, though. Another possibility could be that it's doing it for food. If it's an area that's not terribly rich in protein, yeah, there's some dull sheep, and I'd think that they'd be hunting them, but if for some reason they're not being able to get their proper environmental needs, they might be lashing out. It could be. I mean, if you're going to be hunting stuff out there like, what, moose? Moose are big. <laughs> I mean, they're massive creatures. I mean, if you're gonna be hunting something like that out there, you're gonna have to be a very aggressive, powerful creature to probably take one of those things down by yourself. Another thing is it's a peninsula and peninsulas are kind of like islands where it tends to throw things off from their normal, um, from their normal evolutionary path, especially if it's a isolated peninsula like this where traveling back and forth just isn't an option. So things like nutritional needs can dramatically affect the behavior of an animal. And, and that was one of the interesting things that uh, I saw about Portlock, Alaska, is there's actually an argument between the people that go out there and the people that used to live there on how easy it is to actually get to the town. Like people of the town said, there's, you know, there's no way you can get out here by anything other than boat. And some of the people that have been out there said, no, you can get out there by ATVs or other ways and stuff. So maybe that's one of the things that's going on that helps keep this thing so hidden is, is that it's, it's really rough terrain and you can just hide out there. 
One of the things I know from being a survival instructor back in the day is that when people say an area is impassable, that more likely means it's just very difficult to get through. If you know the right tricks, which I'm assuming these people with the ATVs are talking about, they have a certain path that they take that can get them through it. But if you don't know that trick, you're probably not going to make it through, or at least not easily. But I'm just saying, if, if I have to pass some impassable terrain that's, sorry, some very difficult terrain to get over every single day, I'm going to get a little cranky, and that might make me turn into some sort of murderous creature of the woods. I'd say probably if it's that difficult and we're dealing with something like a primate, which most primates aren't terribly nomadic, they're probably living on the peninsula. I would doubt it if they're going back and forth. I think something that's often really overlooked in the story of Portlock, Alaska, is the fact that this whole town up and abandons the town due to this murderous creature in the woods. That's different than most paranormal stories that we've looked at, even in other towns that we've looked at, like Stull, Kansas, or Dogtown here in Evansville, because it's on the records that people said, we left because something was killing people out in the woods. And it's, it's hard to make a group of people just abandon their home. We were talking about this earlier where Marcus asked me, what would it take me to just up and leave my home? And I'm like, well, I guess it would need to be something like a flood or lava, something where I just knew that I would die if I stayed, something that would give me no choice but to do it. And we're talking about Alaskans. These are people who are used to hard living. Look where it is, like what Vic's talking about. This is Alaska. This is a small rural town where the people know the cops aren't coming. If you have something that's dangerous in the area, be it a predator or a person, what's the town going to do? They're going to come together and just shoot it. And these people just said instead, eh, screw it, we're going to leave. I mean, yeah, they didn't have a huge population, but they had enough of a population to form a posse, which makes me think they were more just afraid of what could we do in this situation. But at that, if you know the thing out there is picking up trees and flipping them over and replanting them in the ground, if I saw that, I mean, I'm not sure if I'd want to go out there and tangle with this. Yeah, it had to have been something that these people just flat out felt couldn't even be handled. Yeah, and even in some newspaper reports that occurred 20 years later where they're trying to talk to people about going back to the area, a lot of them just flat refused. And they didn't even reach out to the state government of Alaska at the time to do anything. Like, that was something that I didn't find when I was researching. They didn't reach out to, uh, you know, the police. They didn't reach out to the governor's office. Nothing. They just instead felt it would be safer just to leave. So for this one, me and Marcus ended up reading a lot of articles. So which one stood, stood out to you, Marcus? One that uh, I liked was this article that I read about the town of Portlock itself. Because if you look up the stories of Portlock, Alaska, you're going to find these, these murderous Sasquatch stories. But another one that I found that was really cool was people of the town also talked about seeing this weird, mysterious woman in a long black dress that was like so long that she was dragging it behind her and she has this white face and she would be seen on these cliffs and just wailing out to the ocean. And I thought that was a really cool thing because I didn't remember that coming up in a lot of other articles that I read about this. One of the things I thought were interesting were the stories involving like bodies washing up in their bays dismembered and things like that. That's just some extreme levels of aggression right there. Do you think that could have been another predatory animal that like it got dumped into the water or maybe like a shark or something could have done that to it? It's always a possibility, but I also don't have anything to make me think that that's the case either. Uh, plus, how are the bodies getting in the water? Maybe it got dumped into the waterways and that's just where it ended up. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have no doubt in my mind that something out there may have murdered the miners and the hunters that went up into the uh, that went out there and got and got killed. I just I don't know about the dismembering part. Oh, it's just such an odd thing. It kind of stuck out to me. I mean, it, it's definitely aggressive behavior that you know goes along with a lot of the the Bigfoot stories out here out here in Portland. Yeah, and another one was the story where the guy gets hit over the head with a piece of large mining or large logging equipment. Mm -hmm. It's not like we haven't heard stories of Sasquatch using tools like that, and they're in the primate family, so it fits really well, but it's also something that you don't hear a lot about. And what's weird to me is if you're strong enough as a creature to rip a tree out of the ground, why would you need to pick up a piece of equipment in order to beat this guy to death with it? 
Maybe it was just a weapon of opportunity. Yeah. Or maybe just wanted to be that you just more malicious when he did it. I mean, primates, we do have that propensity for just being vicious, for being that form of aggression where you're just going to flatten something, even if you don't need to kill it. And you can recognize this in chimpanzees, in many of the greater apes, even bonobos. Something in one of the stories that I wanted to bring up too was the Tom Larson story. And remember the Tom Larson story? He's the guy that he was out and he encounters one of these things down on a beach. And he freaks out, so he runs back home, he grabs his gun, he comes back, and the thing is still there. And he aims his gun at the creature, and the creature stares him down. And he never shoots. Can you imagine the level of intensity that you would have to have as a creature to get a experienced frontiersman like that to not shoot you? I don't know, it could be a um, sort of behavioral adaptation where it knows if it's if it tries to outrun someone with a gun, it's just as likely to get shot. It's kind of like how if a large animal is charging at a goose like a bison or an elephant, the goose will just sit there and stand its ground, knowing that if it just stands there, odds are it's going to freak out the thing charging it. It might be one of those things that's just adapted for survival. It also gives a sense of territorialness to me too, because... You know, if you think about it, he leaves, he goes home, he grabs his gun, he comes back, and the thing is still there. Like, it's not like he, it's not like he, it, it just left knowing, you know, it left and wandered somewhere else. Like, it was still in the area when the guy got back. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, because almost everyone who's disappearing are people who go out of the community and into the wilderness. If these things are territorial and aggressive, I mean, that makes a ton of sense. I mean, it's just shown a flat lack of concern with humans. Like... It, it sees where we are, it doesn't seem to care, and it's not worried that we're there. Is that learned behavior? Like, over time? Like, what do you, like, can how be, do you get to that point? It can be learned or it can be instinctual. Like, a lot of, um, a lot of animals learn to fear humans either through their personal life of encountering them. That's why there's some isolated parts of the world where if you go to them, the animals will just not know how to react to humans. Many of them will remain docile because they don't have a um, notable fear. Most many animals also learned it instinctually, like during uh, the Ice Age, when humans kind of, kind of got our act together and started hunting a lot of these big animals. And we figured out, hey, we can throw these spears and take down a man. It's like <laughs> if I'm over here and it's over there, it can't get me. <laughs> so some animals have a instinctual fear of humans. Other ones build it up over time. So it really kind of depends on the animal and what their upper brain functions are like. For a Sasquatch, I mean, both are quite possible. Look at us. We can. I, I would assume that it is a robust primate. Primates break into two forms, robust and grassian. We're a grassian, but robust primates can also be highly intelligent. It would likely have a similar ability to learn, maybe not as much technical knowledge as us, but enough to understand its environment and react to it, because most primates are kind of on that level. So it could be something like where it's personally learned that, but we also have instinctual fears. Look how most humans react to snakes and spiders. I mean, and, and most of the townsfolk in Port Lock, Alaska, where native, where native people are descended of native Aleuts in the area. So that could also be part of the reason about why they just up and left was because they've had this long history with the creature. Because it's not, it's not new to the people that were there. They, they had seen this. They knew of encounters of these things in other parts of Alaska. Yeah, something that we kind of didn't hit on much so far is that there is this long story tradition of them having encounters with these hairy men. And going back to kind of the territorial thing we were talking about earlier, I want to talk more on the whole idea of taking trees out of the ground and flipping it. That sounds like they're creating a territorial mark. I didn't even right? think about that. Yeah, they're just saying, this is my spot. This is where I'm going to be. Yeah, and it makes sense for loggers who are going way out there to be probably crossing those territorial brown boundaries and not reacting to it. It might be more that these things are just fiercely defending what they see as their land. And when I think about that, when something is marking a particular area, what's it going to be marking it to? It's probably marking it to other things of its, specific, of its species. Like when things like scratch or they piss on a tree to leave their scent or whatever, they're leaving it for other things that can pick up on those things. So I'm thinking maybe like in the woods, are there are they these massive hairy men fights going on between like alpha males? 
I mean, it's possible. I mean, we see that in baboons. We see that in uh, silverback gorillas. I mean, it's not uncommon for primates, but I still think this is more of a territorial boundary than it is like <laughs> one of those things of, hey, if you're looking to mate, I'm I'm over here, and if you're looking to fight, I'm also over here. <laughs> well, no, it's it's pro it's probably like uh, maybe you're right. You're probably you're probably right. I don't know. I'm just I'm thinking like that just jumped in my head of like it's creating this when you're saying it's making a marker. I'm like it's. Usually you're making markers to other things that can recognize that marker. Some, somebody has to be able to tell this. Yeah, I, I really think that this is clearly some sort of message they're trying to send out. But then when it comes to trying to understand something like this, it might even be some message that we aren't even getting. It's hard to understand something that's of not only a different species, one that we don't recognize, one yeah. that we haven't studied. Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to think that it's uh, some sort of message of just, I'm tough, like... Uh, I'm gonna rip this tree out so everybody can see that I'm tough, but nothing's around to see it. Or I don't know, maybe there's female of these things out there. They just sit around and the, all the big male Bigfoot out there's foot trees and whoever flips the biggest tree gets the female. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's how a fight starts. Actually, I could totally see that being a thing because I've seen other crazier things as far as mating rituals in the biological world. I've seen humans do that! <laughs> Okay, humans, we have some crazy biological rituals like peacocking. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punch out this window to show how tough I am. Oh yeah, well, I'm gonna punch this door as hard as I can, trying to impress women. Like we do that. Okay, okay, you, you, you have a point there. You got a point there. Okay, since this is so off from your normal Sasquatch encounter, one of the things you have to ask yourself is, could it not be a Sasquatch encounter? I mean, the description of it being a hairy man does seem to fit, but are there other things you think it could be? The two leading skeptic arguments that I have heard on this, number one, and the one that I like the least, is that it's a bear, and that people are not seeing uh, it accurately because it's like so far away, they're like misjudging how it looks. Like it's a bear on its hind legs, like standing up, towering over people, which I think is insulting to Alaskan frontier, to the people of Portlock, Alaska, that that's what they would be afraid of. Okay, I got one for you. And this is this one's this one's going to be out there. I don't know if this is in the specific oral tradition around Portlock, but in parts of Canada and Alaska, there is a oral tradition of were otters, which would in theory be hairy men. And there's a there's a river there. There it, there's lots of ocean. Could this be a were otter? You're grounded. <laughs> You're grounded for bringing that up. I don't know. I, I just stumbled upon this story about were otters in the oral tradition. I'm like, okay, I got to bring this up. Well, were otters are supposed to be like super aggressive, aren't they? In the thing? No. Um, Am they're I wrong? more trap setting and trickstery. Oh, okay. <laughs> but they're basically people who turn into kind of like a werewolf. They turn into like a hybrid otter. I think if somebody's passing around like lycanthropy. Like I feel like getting were otter would be the short end of the stick. No, no, no. Like, I would totally be about were otter. No, like it's a little above were chicken, <laughs> but a little, little below were bear. <laughs> but it's definitely uh, beats out were horse and were cow, which are also totally things in lore here in Indiana. Mm -hmm. The one argument that I sort of entertained is the idea is the the hairy man out in Portland, Alaska, was a serial killer, and it was a person that was out in the woods that was specifically targeting people. Now, in order for this to be true, this is have to be a big dude because there's accounts of like people finding like 18 uh, inch footprints out there, which is big, seeing as how the average person has a size 10 foot. So, also another problem with that one is this person would have had to have been active for an incredibly long period of time because some of the earlier stories happen around 1900. Serial killers don't stop. I, mean, I guess, but I would think like during those later years, he wouldn't be lifting those heavy pieces of logging equipment unless this guy's a, a real badass. I mean, unless it's a, a murderous family that lives out there. Like, you know, when we when we did the story of the Almas, in that story, we really felt that that was a, a person that people were trying to say was like this Bigfoot-like creature. Maybe what the hairy men out there in Alaska were, they're like the people that live out in the woods. They're just giant men that never shake that never shave, so they're growing really long facial hair and hair, and they're just murdering people out there in the woods. I mean, what we know about serial killers is they're not going to stop. Yeah, and they're, I mean, as long as they can do their going. thing. Yeah. I guess it's a possibility, but still, like, that 18-inch foot range, that's so big, like, 
I, I, I myself, I'm a tall guy. I got big feet. And when I read that, I had my wife measure my feet, and it was just, just shy of 12 inches. Well, I'm not trying to sound more impressive, but 14 uh, size foot. It doesn't take that much, you know, a few more inches, and you're there. Also, two, could two, be eighteen inches. That's that's huge. Four inches. I know. That's, I know that's. I know that's a lot. But I mean, but that would also explain actually why they could do that. Let's get on Guinness and see what is the world record. What's the world record for largest foot? Is this even humanly possible? Because I'm not sure. According to Guinness World Records, the world's largest feet belong to a Robert Wadlow, who wore a size thirty-seven. What's that come to in inches? Thirty-seven. 37 inches? 37 inches. Okay, I totally said my foot size wrong earlier, but okay. but yeah, that, okay. Yeah, apparently human feet can get that big. I would say that's probably pretty darn rare still to have a 20 inch foot, but apparently it's doable. So what do I think this thing really could be? We've talked a lot about this on the channel. We might be talking about a skinwalker. We've talked about it before on the channel where you have these these people that use magical means in order to transform into these sort of half human half animal sort of hybrids so what we could be seeing is we could be seeing some person up in the Alaskan area that's using these to turn into one of these things because think about it you're seeing incredibly aggressive behavior towards humans which we've seen with skinwalker stories it's very territorial which is something else we've seen with skinwalker stories as well. It's got a long history with the native people, which is another thing that's very common in skinwalker stories too. The the whole town of Porlock itself comes together and has a meeting, you know, a little bit in the 1950s. And then it just comes in and says, we can't deal with this thing. It would be just safer to leave and we're never going to go back. You have to be dealing with something that you just deep down feel there is nothing you can do about these things. And that is also common with skinwalker stories. Most skinwalker stories are, it's there, you leave it alone, you don't mess with it. I think we're dealing with Sasquatches here. I think we have a group that's incredibly protective of their territory. They're going out, they're marking them by flipping these trees. And then when humans go out to the wilderness to gather resources, they're going across this border. They're, they're committing this taboo of passing into their territory. I think we're dealing with Sasquatch here. I think we're dealing with a band of Sasquatch that are abnormally protective of their territory. And with humans on the peninsula encroaching inward constantly to gather up resources, they become even more protective. They put up these borders that they have where they flip the trees that's supposed to be this marker of do not cross. And when those borders get crossed, they respond with fatal force. Why does only this group do it and other ones don't? I'm not totally sure, but I really think we're dealing with what many animals are dealing with. Human encroachment and protection of territory. But you can leave your thoughts on that in the comments below. Hey guys, thank you for joining us on this journey through Port Lock. We've had a great time making. We've had a great time with you guys this season. This has been an amazing journey through the paranormal all through season four. We want to thank all of our fans that have been with us since the beginning, all the fans that have just joined in uh, this season, and even the fans that have just joined in this particular episode. Don't worry guys, even though this is the end of season four, We've got a whole season five ready to kick off October 4th. And if you can't wait that long, join us on Patreon where you'll continue to get videos. Yeah, we make exclusive videos just for our patrons. A dollar a month gets you to access to all of those videos. If you really enjoyed the video, don't forget to give us a like, leave a comment. We love those. We always love responding to those comments. Subscribe if you haven't already. And don't forget to hit that little notification bell so that you guys can stay up to date and all the content coming out of One Candle Society, and you can be here for us for the start of Season 5 in October. But most importantly, guys, keep believing, because we'll keep listening.